I'm going to ask you to turn your copy of God's Word to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 2. Um, if you have never read the book of Proverbs, if you've never studied the book of Proverbs, you're missing a beautiful, wonderful, amazing part of the Bible. Now, I believe, and I've been teaching the book of Proverbs for many years now, and every time I read it, I learn something new. Every time I look at it, there's something else for me. Uh, the majority of the Proverbs was often was given to us by Solomon, uh, and he was the wisest man that ever walked the face of the earth. And the reason he wrote the book of Proverbs was to teach us, and it's addressed to his kids, because uh, he says in numerous places, my son, my son, uh, he says, uh, uh, do this and listen to me and listen to your mom and all of that. But Proverbs is designed for you and I to be able to live life. Just simply live life. You say, well, Pastor, I can live life fine. I, like you said to kids, my heart beats, my lungs works in some form or some fashion. My eyes blink every once in a while. You know what I mean? I'm just doing fine. No, no, no. If you're just living life to exist, that's not life. Because Jesus said, I came to give you what? Life and give it to you what? Abundantly. We've talked about that. We know that's part of it. So when, G, when, when the Solomon was writing this, he says, I want to give my kids and all of those who will live down through the ages wisdom and guidance on how to live life. I was reading an article this week, and I'm not going to share it with you because it made me angry. But it seems like everything these days is all kind of pushed around a couple of topics. Equity yeah. and racial issues. Yeah. Uh, it just seems like that's everything. Well, apparently, uh, there's this big movement in some of our uh, liberal states in this nation to, uh, to uh, get rid of, of, of racism uh, in math. Now, I'm not a genius. I'm not the smartest man, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, I mean, I, I get all that. But when I sit down with my checkbook, and I go 5 minus 3 equals 2, I don't care who you are, I don't care what you've got, I don't care what it is, it's 5 minus 3 equals 2 to you, and you, and you. And this mindset that everything has to be about equity and has to be uh, centered around some kind of racial injustice is getting a little old. Yeah. So listen, and understand, my Bible says love my neighbor as myself. And man, that's what I'm doing. And I don't care, again, I don't care what you look like, I don't care what you do, I don't care what you've got. I care about you, I want your soul to be in heaven. But listen, Solomon wrote this book and he said, I'm not writing this to white people or black people or Hispanic people or Asian people. He says, I'm writing this to those who will believe it, those who will trust it, those who will take it. So I took this con, this, this, this uh, brain freeze mindset of racism in math and said, well, let's have a little math problem here. So here's my math problem. You you fill in your name there, plus the ifs of the Bible will equal a then. Now, you say, well, that sounds kind of silly. No, because throughout the Word of God, God says, if you will do this, then I will do this. He's not saying, I'm asking you to work your way to heaven. He said, I'm not asking you to earn your salvation. He's simply telling us time and time and time again that here is your option. If you do this, this will be the result. But if you don't do this, this will not be the result. You can go all day long and tell me 2 plus 2 equals 5, and I'll tell you, you're a nut job. Okay? It just doesn't work that way. And a lot of folks look at the Bible the same way. Well, I'm going to believe this part, but I'm not going to believe that part. And then they wonder why their life is a train wreck, or worse yet, why their family is a train wreck. My friends, we need to get back to the Word of God. We need to get back to the Bible. We need to get back to the point where we're saying it's not going to be about what CNN tells us and what MSN LSD says and what any of these other places say. Amen. It's about what the Word of God tells us. So listen to this. 
Proverbs chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And I know I'm going to get emails and all that kind of stuff tough. You weenies sit in your mom's basement and send me all kinds of hate mails. And that's up to you. But let me read you the word of God. And you say, well, you're not being very loving. It's not that I don't love you. But sometimes you just got to call it out. you got to say, this is foolishness. Why are we putting up with this anymore? Why are we standing idly by and saying, well, I don't want to cause any problems. Gang, I'm not saying be ugly. I'm not saying be mean. I'm not saying attack anybody on the street like the left does. But I am saying we need to begin to say, thus saith the Lord. Read it with me. Beginning in, in Proverbs chapter 2. My son, Solomon again, talking to his kids. But also this is going to go down through the ages for all of us. This is the inspired and errant infallible word of God. My son. Listen, listen to all the ifs in this particular passage. If you accept my words and store up my commands within you, comma, verse 2, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, and if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, look at verse 5, then... You will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Today I want you to look at the ifs and the then and plug yourself into that so that you can enjoy the wisdom and the understanding of God. Before we go any further, would you pray for me? Father, it's in Jesus' name that we ask that you would open the eyes of our hearts we can no longer be silent. The problem with the church right now, we're not praying enough, we're not preparing enough, and we're not preaching enough. The whole counsel of God. So Father, today I ask in Jesus' name that you would challenge each one of us to look at this text and remember that the ifs are our responsibility. The ifs are there for our direction and our guidance and the ability to take those on. And then you said, I will answer you. I will attend to those things. So God teaches us here today what it means to be you plus ifs equals then. And I ask it in Jesus' name. The first thing I want you to see in the text is it says right here, my son, if you accept. So let's look at that first of all. If you accept. So the first step there is you've got to decide whether you're going to actually take hold of this or not. And it's up to you. I've had people tell me, oh, the Bible's full of errors, the Bible's full of mistakes, the Bible's full of this, full of that. Actually, they're the ones that are full of that. But nonetheless, the Bible, I always hand the Bible and say, okay, now show me. Show me the error. Yeah. And then it gives me some little weenie, oh, you know, there are two angels in one place, there's one angel in another place, the two. <laughs> All baloney. All talking points from some goofball. The fact is that we have to decide in our hearts up front that we're going to accept this as the Word of God. Amen. First thing, we got to receive it. We have got to listen to it. Now, what some folks will do is they'll hear it, they're not receiving it. It goes in one ear, and what do you do? Out the other. You gotta receive. You gotta say, okay, let me chew on this a little bit. Let me hang on to this a little bit. Let me think about this. Let me meditate on this a little bit. Let me run it through my mind and through my heart and get, get an understanding. I want to know this. So you gotta re receive it. The Bible's very clear. Deuteronomy chapter 6. You've heard me read out of Deuteronomy 6 numerous times. But, but Moses is telling the nation of Israel, these are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. Remember, God says, I'm giving you the land, but you're going to have to go over and take it. So Moses says, here's what God has told me to tell the nation of Israel, he says. He says, so that, in other words, the reason I'm giving you all of this information is for this purpose. So that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all the decrees and commands that I give you. And so that you may enjoy what? Long life. The promise of God says, I am going to give you life if you'll simply listen to me. Now that does not necessarily mean many, many years. 
Some of our lives, well, your years are cut short. Some of our lives are shorter than others. But, but, but God was telling Moses, tell these people that they will live a life that is much more pleasing to God and much more satisfying in their own lives if they'll simply take me at my word. You've got to receive that, though. Many folks don't. Many folks hear it. They dismiss it and move on and wonder, wonder, wonder why there's so much anger and frustration and bitterness in their hearts. Why do you think people are going out there and attacking Jewish people? Because they have anger and bitterness in their hearts. When we should be standing with Israel, when we should be honoring and glorifying God, the chosen people of God, the Jewish nation, and people are going after them. When you mess with God's people, you're messing with God. That's right. You better receive that. Not only do you receive it, but you've also got to retain it. It's one thing to read the Word of God. It's another thing to remember the Word of God, isn't it? It's a whole other thing to take the Bible and go, hey, wait a minute, God says this about this situation. God said this about marriage, and God said this about family, and God said this about sex, and God said this about, about raising kids, and God said, you've got to retain it. And that takes effort. That takes work. And I'll tell you one who has is, who is studied the Bible for, for two-thirds of my life, and I've still just scratched the surface. That's why when somebody go and say, you'll ask me some passage that's kind of obscure or something like that, I go, I don't know. They just can't retain all of what I'm trying. I really want God to give me that wisdom. And that's all he's saying here. If you will accept my words and store up my commands within you. The King James actually uses the term hide, if you'll hide my commands. Now, some folks would use that as an excuse to say, oh, that means I'm not supposed to talk about it. No, no, no. We're in the trouble as a nation because Christians have not been talking about it. We're afraid to offend somebody. We're afraid to, to, to embarrass them or maybe say the wrong thing. Look, I don't want you to say the wrong thing, but I want you to say something. Say something. Because if the Spirit of God is moving you, my Bible says, and Jesus tells His disciples, don't worry about when you're in front of governors and in front of important people, because when you've got to open your mouth, it's the Holy Spirit that's going to speak through you, because you have sought me every single day of your life. I'm going to give you the words that you need. Say something! Yep. Yep. Oh, no. We don't want... I just, one of the guys on the news this morning, the guy that got attacked, you know, by all those thugs that came out and attacked this Jewish man, he was wearing a yarmulke. That's all he was doing. He was wearing a symbol of his faith. And they attacked him for it. And you know what he said now? He said, I'm not going to wear my yarmulke anymore. Oh. Now, what did the, those thugs do to that guy? They basically crushed him. Now, he knows what the, what the Word of God says, and he knows what his faith tells him to do. But now he's going to hold back on that. Now, I, I don't want to miss I don't, don't want to make light of this. The guy got beat up bad. <laughs> But friends, I'm telling you, this is only going to continue in the Jewish nation, in the Christian people. All It's only going to get worse. And if you decide to throw in the towel now, you're never going to make it through the way things are going to go. But we've got to start speaking out. We've got to start standing up. We've got to accept, receive that word, and retain that word for the glory of God. Remember this, it's Deuteronomy 6 or 7, these commands I give you today are be upon your hearts. That's the first place that they're supposed to land. But why are they going to land there? So that you can impress them. Remember when we were kids? You may... I, I remember to myself when we were kids. I know you all say when old well, pastor was walking with dinosaurs when he was a kid. But nonetheless, I used to love Play-Doh. Didn't Play-Doh a lot. I don't care how old you are. Play-Doh is fun to play with. And you get messing with it, you know, you make all these little goofy things and all that kind of stuff. But I used to love those little, those little packages of things. And, and you would take the Play-Doh and you'd smash it in there and you'd make some kind of, I don't know, thing in there. And then you'd pull it out and it had the impression, the Play-Doh gave you the impression of whatever that little form was. That's literally what it's saying. It's saying, it says, impress this. Put this into your kids so it takes shape in their lives. You say, well, they don't like when I start talking to them about Jesus. Some of you have told me, said, I can't talk to my adult kids about Jesus. Please don't give up. 
You're the only gospel they're probably ever going to hear. Because I'll guarantee you, they're, they're hanging around with all their lost friends and all those folks that are all validating their bad behavior. They're acting up, their foolishness. They're hanging around all of those folks. You may be the only, the only chance they've got to hear the gospel. Please don't give up. Please don't stop. Because I'm telling you, you got to impress that upon your kids. And it says, talk about it. And we've read this a million times in this church. Talk about that when you sit at home, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and you get up. In other words, all day, every day. Make God the focus of your conversation. And you got to be creative sometimes. you got to be able to say, look, I, I, you know, I'm driving down the road, I see an accident. Lord, I'm, I'm thankful that you kept me from being in that accident. And then I pray for those people that are in that accident. Because God, these people are going to suffer. They're not like, even if they didn't suffer physical things, the, the, the heartache and the hassle and all the things that go along with having an accident where you just tow your car. How are they going to get to work, Lord? How are they going to, how they, where's that peace going to be in their life? How are the insurance going to be? I mean, there's so many things. Especially when you've got young people around. Like I said, my daughter was the one that got my attention. Dad, we need to pray for them. She was absolutely right. Teach them with your kids all day long, day in and day out. The only reason that we're, the problem that we're at is because our kids don't know what they believe. And they don't know what they believe because we act like we don't know what we believe. Heaven help us to not attend by accepting the words and storing up the commandments within us. Not only do we need to accept it, but if you allow, look what verse 2 says. Look what it says here. Turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding. Now, there's, there's a couple of things there. When you turn your ear, that's what he's basically saying, listening or paying attention. I would refer to that as uh, filling your head. Okay? When you're listening, now sometimes when I'm in my car and I've got the radio on, there's certain things that I'm listening to, and there's just certain things that are there for noise purposes so I don't get bored driving back and forth to Lansing. But usually I'm listening to my radio, I'm going to listen to it, which is a little scary sometimes on 95, 96, because if you're not paying attention to what you're doing, you get killed on the road easily. So you want to make sure you're paying attention to the road, but, but listening, but turning your ear is literally saying, I am going to focus my listening on there, and I want whatever it is that I'm listening to to fill me up with that information. Now, again, you've got to make sure you're filling yourself up with good stuff. This is the sad part, the scary part. When I ask people about why they believe what they believe, they'll say, well, I saw it on the news, or I saw it on an internet website or something like that. And I'll say, man, what you believe is, is not accurate. You want to know the truth. You want to know what's really going on? You see, you've got to turn your ear, you've got to fill your head wanting to hear truth. You want to hear that. Fill your head. The Bible says in John 7, 17, if anyone chooses to do the will of God, he will find out whether my teaching, now Jesus is saying it, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. He says, if you're really listening for God, you're going to hear God. I ask our church to pray about our new facility. And I think some of you have. I think some of you not. We need to pray and seek the wisdom of God about what our next step is. Because if we want to do the will of God, then we're going to be able to test it and make sure that it is indeed what the will of God. He says, you'll find out whether God's word is true or not. Whether God's word is provided. God is going to provide those things. Or whether we have to kick and scream and, and, and all those things to see things done. I want to do the will of God. Because God, the will of God is always the best way. I hope you agree with me on that. Filling your head is great, but also to allow, you've got to fill your heart. Look what the text says here in verse 2. Turning your ear towards wisdom and applying your heart. That word applying really comes from a Hebrew word that means to stretch. To stretch. That, it, it's to, to elongate, if you will. So it's saying that there's always more room to put more God in there. There's always more room to put more information in there. There's always a willing. You never want to come to say, well, this is all I'm ever going to believe. This is all I'm ever going to accept. Because there's always more to learn. And we know that the Bible says from out of the overflow of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. You know why so many of us struggle with profanity? 
That's what's in our heart. I've had to work very hard my whole life, and I still slip up. I still slip up. But man, you've got to make that heart filled with God so that when, when that thing is squeezed, when that thing is, is pressured, it's God that comes up, not the world. Applying your heart. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 through 23. My son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Filling your head. Keep them within your heart. Filling your heart. For they are the life of those who find them and health to the man's whole body. You know, we read in the Bible, it tells us about how to make yourself healthy. Simply by reading the Word of God. How you can live a more productive, more purposeful life. Simply by taking God at His Word. But we won't read it. We'll throw it on the couch or we'll throw it on the table to look good for the neighbors when they come over. Throw it in the back window of our car. We don't open it up and read it. There will come a time when this will be illegal. There will come a time when this will no longer be accessible. If it's in your heart, it's in your heart, it'll never, ever, ever go away. Amen. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Fill your head, fill your heart, if you allow. Number three, if you appeal, look what it says in verse three, right here. And if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and that's where we usually mess up. When you open the Word of God, you say, okay, I'm going, to read, I'm going to read the Bible. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to read the Bible. <laughs> so I'm going to open up my Bible. Oh, in those days and that time, I will make a righteous branch from the sprout of David's line. Hey, I read the Bible! That's exactly what I said right there, by the way. Where do we say, Lord, I'm asking you to help me to understand this. Give me insight. Let me love your word the way I love you. Isn't that kind of a sad statement? How much do we love God to reject his word? Let me love you and love, love your word. In other words, making an appeal. It says, and if you will call out for insight and cry aloud, that word, uh, Call for insight literally means to, for meaning, clarity, and discernment. That's what the Hebrew word means. Lord, give me a, an ability to clearly understand what you're saying. In our proper study on Thursday nights, we'll have debates and, and things, you know, and, and different ideas and different thoughts. And that's all well and good. But my prayer is always that we have a clarity, a more, be a more better, <laughs> let me speak for a living, a, a better understanding of what the Word of God truly says. <coughs> Give us clarity. Let me understand. Let me, let me discern what it is. And it says to call out for insight. Lord, let me see this the way you want me to see it. Psalm 25, verse 4 and 5. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are my you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in, in you all day long. Lord, let me understand. Let me grasp this. Call out. Not only cry, call out for insight, but, but also cry for intellect. Lord, give me the mind to be able to understand. And, and I'll be the first to tell you, there's a lot of things in this Bible I don't understand. I, I, and I'll, I'll be honest with you. And I say, Lord, I'd really like to understand this. But for some reason, he says, no, you're not, you're not ready yet. I'm okay with that. And the reason we don't understand some of the deeper things is because we really haven't accepted the shallow things. We've got to get past Jesus, not get past it. We've got to understand Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Before we can get into soteriology and eschatology and all that kind of stuff. Appeal. Lord, I want to know. Please, help me. Give me insight. Give me intellect. The word cry there, by the way, and I wrote this down. It, it, it means to be certain, in a certain state for a considerable duration. So when it says cry out, it's saying, Lord, help me! It's really saying, Lord, I want to continue 
to call on you, to cry out for understanding and for wisdom and for guidance and for That's why I'm telling kids to pray continually. That's part of the way that you do. Lord, I, I want to understand this. I want to recognize what it is you're trying to teach me. And I want to be able to apply it when I see all the crazy things on the television and on my computer. I want to stand with you, God. And I'm asking for understanding. Look what it says. And if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding. Again, this is one of the yes. The Bible says the reason we don't get most things is we don't ask. We, we, we just don't ask. We, don't, we, we say, well, that must be something I'm, I just don't get. It. Lord, I want to I understand every word in this book. I want to understand this all the way from Genesis all the way through maps. Some of you thought that was funny. Some of you have no clue what I'm talking about. It's all right. It's in the back of your study Bible. There's a bunch of maps about Paul's journeys and all that stuff. That's what I was saying. It's past revelation, just so you know. Yeah. Anyway, from the lesson. Ephesians 1, 5, 1, 17. I keep asking that God, our Lord, uh, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the unveiling, so that you may know Him better. I mean, isn't that the bottom line that we're trying to, to, to do, is to know the Lord better? He says, if you'll call out and you'll cry out, that's part of it. That's got to be a, a passion and a desire for us. Because when we get down to the then, then we will have understanding. And we will find knowledge. But I'm not there yet. Number four. If you accept, if you allow, if you appeal. Number four, if you appreciate. Look at this next text. Verse four. Look what it says. And if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure. I don't believe in the lottery. I think it's just a government supported act of gambling. If you play the lottery, that's between you and God. I don't do it. Therefore, I am never going to win. If you see the pastor Jeff won the lottery because somebody bought me a ticket, okay? I am not buying any lottery ticket. But understand this, somebody that has bought a lottery ticket and then finds that they had the winning numbers, they will burn down their house to find that ticket, right? They will go to great lengths because they know that little worthless piece of paper has some numbers on it that is going to allow them to get something more. God says, I don't want you to waste your time on some goofy little ticket so that you can get something more on the world standards. He says, I want you to search for the wisdom and, the, and, the, and the, the beauty of God's Word as if it was a real hidden treasure. How much would you look for a treasure if you knew there was something? I, I, I've watched a couple of times this, The Curse of Oak Island. Have you seen this thing? Uh, you've seen it. And I, I watched it like for 10 minutes. And, and the only thing I know about that island, they've been tearing this place apart for years and ain't found nothing. And yet every week, people come back and say, oh, let's see what they catch this week. And they're always saying, well, next week we're going to find something there. I guarantee you. Now, again, I haven't watched it up. Maybe they have found something pretty impressive. They did find little things. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, keep you hooked. That's right. But they're spending millions of dollars digging up gazillion, gazillion, that's a word, gazillion tons of dirt and moving all this stuff looking for something. God says, all I want you to do is look to this as if it is, because it is a treasure. It is the most valuable thing. I was laying in bed last night. And again, I'm kind of getting used to being alone, that kind of stuff, so I, I'll hear things. And last night I woke up and I, and I smelled something, and I was like, I wonder what the other guy sounds a little gross, you know. He, Pastor's talking about smelling something. Anyway, um, but I smelled something. Man, it smells like something's burned. So I, I got up, I'm walking around the house, and looking, and all that kind of stuff. I want to make sure that uh, that there was nothing, nothing really being a problem. And and then I began to think, if the house did catch on fire, what was the first thing that I would grab besides my clothes? And I didn't have an answer. 
And I felt bad about that. Now, I would shoot, I, this, the, the churchy thing would be, well, I'd have to run to get my Bible first. I didn't come to mind at three in the morning. Isn't that sad? God convicted me then. He said, if you think anything else is more important than this, you are messed up. Pastor. <laughs> Try going back to sleep on that one. Search for it. Look into it. Desire it. Hunger for it. Thirst for it. All of these things. David said, and you hear me quote this about every Sunday, your word have I written in my heart that I may not sin against you. I am pouring myself into your word, God, that I would know it and it would be a part of me and I would not value anything more important than this book right here. To appreciate the value of the Word of God. So that you can testify. Man, I'm so glad I know God and I know His Word because I've gotten out of, I've avoided so many pitfalls and hang-ups. My, the, the one that always takes people off. I get approached all the time by this multi-level marketing stuff, you know, and if you're into that, that's up to you. I, it's not me. You know, I, I don't want to have a bunch of gazillion people underneath me so I can make money and, you know, they're trying to survive nonetheless. But yeah, I get approached by that all the time. Well, I think it's the Word of God that really, really convicted me of it. Lost all kinds of things just now. That that anything that I do to try to get ahead on myself at the risk or the or the or the, or the, uh, the detriment of somebody else is not of God's word. And you can argue with me that after that all the life, but that was where my conviction came in. Because of what the word of God says. What the word of God says, put the needs of others above your own. Value, Proverbs. Since how much better to get wisdom than gold and to choose understanding than silver? We, we've read these things in our Thursday night Bible study. What about this one? Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him, it says, while he is near. Let the, why does it say that? Because if I read Romans 1 correctly, it sounds like, you know, these people just wanted to continue in their sin. And finally God says, okay, fine. Have at it. I can call you, I can beg you, I can present myself to you, I can bring people into your life, I can do all this, and you still want to live your foolish life? Fine. The Bible says he gives them over to the depravity, the perverseness of their hearts. Their choice, not his. Seek him while he may be found. Call him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. Look what it says. And, and an evil man, his thoughts, let him turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will freely pardon. That's right. Freely. No strings attached. What we value, we prioritize, preserve, and protect. Let me give you an example. Probably haven't been to a museum in a year because they're like, whoa, 17 masks and, you know, Hand sanitizer, they bathe in it every day, they watch you in the door. What's a museum? To some people, it's just a bunch of old paintings. To some, it is a beautiful representation of our past. And we preserve those, and we protect them, and we prioritize them. Now, I'm not going to get into the political conversation about funding and all of that kind of stuff. I'm not going to get into that. But those things are valuable, so we find ways to provide, pr preserve them so future generations can see that. <laughs> you think future generations need to see this? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. It is valuable. It is important. It is necessary. And, 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 and that wicked man and that evil man with his thoughts can turn away from those and God will say, I forgive you. And they will be made right. We need to appreciate the value. But also we need to appreciate the volume. Now I'm not talking bump up the volume, bump up the volume. Yes, yes. <laughs> anyway, it's like that. It's as good as I can do that. I ain't going to do it anymore. You say, that's pretty bad, Pastor. Yep, I know. I don't mean volume like loud. I'm talking about volume as mass. A massive amount of information available to us from the mouth of God. Psalm 19, 
verse 9 through 11. The fear of the Lord is pure. We'll, under, we'll explain fear of the Lord in a minute. It means reverence, it means respect, the awesomeness of God. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. In other words, they won't lead you astray. They are more precious than gold, much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, honey from the comb. We read this a few weeks ago. By then your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. You know what he says right now? He says, here is all of this amazing word of God available for you and for me. It's more important than gold. It's sweet. Now, I've never eaten honey from the comb. Someone tells me it's wonderful. I've, I've never had it before. I know it probably looks a little gross to pick that big old thing that beeves have spit up all over and then they, but anyway, nevertheless, but I'm told this, yeah, I know y'all are like, he's so gross to Vince, that's all right. I didn't sleep much last night. I was repenting. But anyway, um, but honey from the comb apparently is just more amazing than just, you know, honey that you get out of that little plastic bear dude from the church, from the, from the church, from the grocery store. And you not, we may have some here at the church, I don't know, but anyway. But anyway, look what it says. By them your servant is warned. You know what it says? As I read this, I understand not only what I am to do, but what I'm not to do. Right. We learned Thursday night, the Bible tells in Ezekiel, that, that if, if we share that message with, uh, with somebody and, and they reject it, then, then, the blood, then, then they die in their sin and the blood is on their hands. But if we don't share that message and, and they never hear it and they die in their sin, their blood is on our hands. That's hard to watch and hard to think about. There's so much here, so many things that God wants for us to know. And we're warned. And those that follow them, there is a reward. We need to appreciate the value and the volume, which brings me to my final point. So we are saying, Amen, glory, hallelujah. He is on a roll today. That's okay. I like it. Number five. This is what you attain. If, 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 if equals then. Then you will attain. What does it mean? Then you will gather. Then you will grasp. Then you will understand. Look what it says in verse 5. Then, let me start over. My son, if you accept my if you accept my words, distort my commands within you, turn your ear towards wisdom, apply your heart towards understanding. And if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as hidden treasure, then, then, you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Let's first of all talk about fear of the Lord. You know what that means? That means then you will find reverence for God. When you read the Word of God, and I'll admit there's some of these things that are pretty dry, but even in the dry parts, I still want to say, well, what are you trying to teach me here? When I'm reading through Leviticus, <laughs> I'm reading through numbers. Uh, but man, every once in a while, there's those things that just hit you right in the middle of that face, and you kind of go, wow, God, thank you for that. I like in Numbers chapter 16, I, and I say I like, it's, it's sad, but these people were busting Moses' chops about things that he had done. Moses basically tells us, all right, if I've done you wrong, then... Then you'll die a natural death. Look how he puts this. He says, if I've, done, if I've done something wrong to you, you're going to die a natural death. However, if I haven't done something wrong, you're accusing me of it, you're going to die some natural, super, supernatural death. And you know what he says? And everybody says, all right, everyone back up from those guys. And the Bible says the earth opens up and swallows them and their families and all their possessions. Now, you said that's pretty sick to think that's funny. No. These people were coming after God's man, and, and, and then they were surprised. When God judged. You see, reverence for God has said, God, I, I don't want to take lightly my relationship with you. I don't want to, to make fun or, or to, to be quiet when I have the opportunity to speak out. Yeah, you'll be chastised. Yeah, you'll be laughed at. Yeah, you'll be picked on. But friends, there's going to be times when we get to shine like the, like the sun in a dark and dying group of people and, and you're going to be the only opportunity they have because you revere the Lord Jesus Christ. That word fear, by the way, means to cause, it, it means reverence, awesomeness, and worship. To fear the Lord is to worship God. 
in his awesomeness. To revere him as king and lord and savior and master and teacher and friend. Amen. I'm glad he's God. The Bible tells us numerous places in Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. I'll get to knowledge in a second. We see this in Psalm 96, verse 8. I describe to the Lord the glory due His name. OMG is not glory to God's name. No. Bring an offering. Come into His courts. I'm serious. If we spend more time talking before we walk into church about what we saw on Fox News this morning than we did on the number of times we got the chance to share God this week, Friends, we're in bad shape. We're in bad shape. And God is not going to bless the ministry if we're not coming here with the reverence and the awesomeness and the willingness to worship Him the way He deserves. We want God to bless our church. We want God to provide us with another, another venue. But we've got to get focused. And we've got to show reverence to God because He's the only reason we're here. He's the only reason. You attain the reverence of God. He says, then you will fear the Lord. You will understand the fear of the Lord. Second thing, it says, and you will find the knowledge of God. Do you know what that means? It means not only will you have reverence for God, but you'll have a relationship with God. That's the hardest thing for a lot of folks to understand. You say, hey, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Jesus died 2,000 years ago. He's up there somewhere else. Man, I ain't in. Go back and hang out with him. We can't sit around and eat nachos together. Nothing like that. I guess you're right. You can't eat nachos with Jesus. But I can still talk to him. And I don't even hear him talk back sometimes. But I can talk with him. I can trust him. I can dump on him all of the things that go on in our lives. I can share with him those things that you've shared with me. People oftentimes ask, where does the pastor go when he's got a bad day? Lord. <laughs> He'll take it all, man. He'll just let me all over him. He's okay with it. He's okay with it with you too. Because there's a relationship there. We see relationship means that they're not going to run off. They're not going to take off. Knowledge. That word in the Hebrew is defined information of a person with a strong implication of relationship to that person. That's what that word knowledge actually means. It's not book sense. It's, it's relationship. I would do about anything to spend time with my wife right now. I yearn for her smile, for her touch, for her encouragement. We have to have the same and more in the relationship with the Lord. Because I promise when you feel alone, he says, I'm here. When you feel confused, he says, I give you wisdom. <clears throat> when you feel weak, he says, I'm giving you strength. And that all comes right from here. All of it. Jesus says in Matthew 7, verse 7, they ask him to give to you, seek, and you will find knock, and the door will be open for everyone who asks, receives. <laughs> Pastor, let's go back to that uh, lottery thing. I've been praying for the lottery for a lot of years. Really? <laughs> you want a guy who can't trust you with the little things to give you something like that? Bible even says that. How do you expect me to trust you with the big things if I can't trust you with the little things? And everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks find, and the one who knocks, the door will be open. And can I just say one more thing? When God closes a door, he does not open a window. Okay, can you just get that out of your head? 
All right? Thieves come in through the window. If God closes a door, it's only because He's got another door He wants you to go through. You're not going to sneak in some other way. If He closes it, He's closed. So He says, a knock and the door will be open. Sorry. Relationship with God. Matthew 7. Then I've got one more verse here real quick. I know I'm along with it. That's okay. 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. We know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding. John says, we understand who Christ is. And Christ has given us His wisdom and His understanding so that we can carry that on. Hopefully you learn some stuff here in these four walls that will allow you to carry out there and interact with other folks. Not in a mean-spirited way, but in a, in a passionate way, in a positive way. That we would let folks know that there is a better answer than whoever's living in Washington, whoever happens to be our representative or our senator. They can't do anything. Katie, Katie, didn't you call your representative this week? What'd you get? Focus. Nothing. She had some things. And I said, well, you need to call your representative. Every hour and a half hour. Yeah. She called and called and called. No answer. Because they're never in their office. It's a Democrat, by the way, just so you know. It's Katie again. Yeah. Just saying. What's that? Well, I called the thing in. I, you know, at first, I gave my name and number. And I said, it's Katie again. I haven't heard from you. Still haven't heard from you. Yeah, they're too busy, busy with equity and all that stuff. But nonetheless, look what he says. He says, given us understanding, so that we may know Him who is true. God has given up His Word so that we can understand who He is and we can receive more of that, more understanding. And we are in Him who is true, even His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Beautiful verse. So you... Plus the ifs will lead you to the then. Where are we in the process? Are we accepting of his words and storing up his commands within us? Have we turned an ear towards wisdom? Well, you're here, so I'm hoping that that's part of the reason you're here, so you can hear something. But then also applying your heart to understanding it. Again, don't take my word for it, read it yourself. I'm giving you everything you need. And if you call out for insight, God, I want to know you. I want to know more about your word. I want to understand who you are and what purpose you've got for my life. And, and cry out and, 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 and say, God, I'm not going away until I know. And if you look for it for silver and search for it like hidden treasure, God says, I'm going to give you understanding. We're going to have a relationship because you're going to revere me for who I am, he says. That's God. That's God. That's the then. And I pray you will take God at His word. Let's pray together. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, we ask. Lord, we're asking to know you better. To give you our undivided attention. To not have a critical spirit, but have a, a, a spirit of, of intensity, of, of not being quiet, but not being, being mean spirited either. God, our church, your church, is, is at a crossroads. And Father, you will either lead us together in a direction that is God-honoring for you, or we will become comfortable and follow the world. And Father, I can't stand that idea. So Lord, let us be people of prayer. Let us be people of passion. Let us be people of priority and perseverance. And let us be people of praise. For God, that's what it means when we've taken all the ifs and come to the then. Lord, that's our prayer here this morning. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen.
Hey, I want to thank you for tuning in. It's always a blessing to know that there are people that are listening to our messages and being encouraged by the Word of God. We'd like to invite you to come and join us at Four Winds Church. We meet at the Marquee Theater at 135 East Main Street in downtown Northville. Uh, we meet at 11 o'clock. We ask you to bring your Bible because I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to read it yourself. You can also go to our website at fourwindslove.org. That's fourwindslove.org and get information there. I hope we see you next Sunday. God bless.